the holy devil, they called him. Rasputin, one of history's most riveting yet revolting characters. Rasputin, a peasant priest who wielded fatal control over Tsar Nicholas and the Empress of Russia. Rasputin, what was the secret of his mysterious power? is written. This is George Vanderman presenting as the answer to your deepest needs, the living Christ. Today from the Comrades in Christ series on the heritage of Soviet faith, Holy Devil of the Tsar. This is the old winter palace of the Tsars in Leningrad. Before the revolution of 1917, Leningrad was the capital of the Russian Empire, known as St. Petersburg, and it became the stomping ground of Rasputin. Rasputin, his very name, of course, has intrigued the world for the seven decades since his death. The long-haired, wild-eyed peasant from Siberia has been memorialized in more than 20 movies, beside dozens of documentaries, miniseries, and plays. Rasputin's rough-hewn appearance belied his role as the favored guest of the royal court. He gloried in the contrast between his peasant mannerisms and the polished etiquette of the Tsar's social circle. As he mingled with the guests, entering the palace with their fashionable furs, Rasputin thrust his coarse black tunic into the arms of the startled footman. Then, striding confidently into the crowded ballroom, the hawking 33-year-old became the immediate center of attraction. He grabbed the hands of the noblemen and their wives with his own huge hands gazing fiercely into their eyes. He interrogated them about personal matters, offering intimate advice. Flouting his lack of education, he unabashedly belched forth crude language. He even plunged his unwashed hands into his favorite fish soup. Incredible as it may seem, however, the uncouth peasant from Siberia charmed the hearts of St. Petersburg social elite. His barbarian manners attracted, seemingly, rather than repelling, his titled admirers. To them, he was an exotic diversion in a restless, meaningless society. One woman recalled her first encounter with Rasputin, as recorded in the classic biography Nicholas and Alexandria. Our eyes met, she said. His eyes held mine, those shining steel-like eyes which seemed to read one's inmost thoughts. He came forward and took my hand. Thou art worried. Well, nothing in life is worth worrying over. It is necessary to have faith. God alone is thy help. Rasputin embellished his conversations with ancient Russian proverbs and quotes from the Bible. He became a sought-out spiritual counselor, regarded as a holy man of God, but in reality, Rasputin was anything but devout. As a carousing young man, he had earned the nickname by which he was known the rest of his life. You see, in the Russian language, Rasputin means licentious, dissolute. He did profess a dramatic conversion to Christianity. Returning from a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, he affirmed a fervent faith in Christ. But actually, he never abandoned the wild orgies and drunkenness for which he became legend. How then did he manage to win the confidence of the church leaders? Well, they saw an undeniable spiritual power emanating from his blazing hypnotic eyes. And so the religious hierarchy of Russia endorsed Rasputin as God's servant to the royal family. The peasant priests seemed to have the power of divine healing and the royal family desperately needed healing in 1912 when the Tsar's son became ill. The boy suffered from an internal hemorrhage so serious that funeral arrangements were made. In that crisis hour, a telegram arrived from Rasputin with the startling message, the little one will not die. Immediately, the bleeding stopped. Rasputin's prophecy came true. The aunt of Tsar Nicholas testified, there's no doubt about Rasputin's healing powers. 
I saw those miraculous effects with my own eyes, and that more than once. I also know that the prominent doctors of the day had to admit it. Empress Alexandra and Tsar Nicholas became convinced beyond question that Rasputin must be God's messenger. How else could he work such miracles, they imagined. Well, before long, the wild peasant, through his healing power, virtually controlled the royal family. The fall of the Russian Empire was not long in following. One historian concluded the fatal influence of that man, Rasputin, was the principal cause of death of those who thought to find in him their salvation. The life of Rasputin is but one chapter in the fascinating history of religion in Russia. You'll read more about Rasputin and much, much more in our new book, Comrades in Christ. It's full of vital information to enrich your knowledge of Christian history. I think you'll also find much to strengthen your faith and help you in your daily walk with your Lord. No obligation, of course. It's our gift for you today. At the close of the telecast, I'll tell you where you can call or write. Now, let's take a break from the adventures of Rasputin and come back to the 1990s. This matter of faith healing is quite relevant to our day, you know. Faith healers crisscross the country in the name of God. Many of them are charlatans, no doubt, deceiving their audiences with pretended miracles. But is it possible that some of them have real miracle working power? And if so, is that gift of healing necessarily from God? Many Christians automatically assume that any supernatural power must come from God. But in the case of Rasputin, this raises the troubling question, can Satan actually heal? And if so, how can we tell the working of the devil from the working of God? Important questions, wouldn't you say? Absolutely vital to understand. Let's open our Bibles and learn the truth about miracles. And we first turn, of course, to the book of Revelation to learn about deceivers in the last days. Revelation, the 16th chapter, almost to the end of the Bible, verse 14. Revelation 16, 14. 1614 says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. There it is. Just before the coming of Christ, demons will work miracles, genuine miracles from the devil, and believe it or not, these satanic powers perform their wonders in the name of Jesus Christ. Our Lord himself warned Matthew 7, verses 22 and 23. He said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So false prophets like Rasputin will use Christ's name to practice evil. And through, through these deceivers, the devil performs all kinds of lying wonders to entrap the unsuspecting. Evidently, miracles themselves are not proof of God's presence. Never forget it, friend. Some miracles are the work of the enemy done in the spirit of lawlessness, violating God's law. Listen to this clear, crystal clear distinction between genuine Christianity from the enemy's counterfeit. 1 John 5, verse 3. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Genuine love for God is the test. And true love for God obeys his commandments. So love for God means more than a warm feeling that warms our hearts when we worship. The proof of Christian love is not miracles, my friend. Not speaking in tongues. The proof is keeping God's commandments. That's what the word says. Rasputin, despite his pretended claim to holiness, trampled upon the Ten Commandments. Ladies of the Tsar's court fell prey to his adulterous advances. The supposed holy man urged the women to go ahead and sin with him. He assured them that only after they indulged in sin could they appreciate the blessing of forgiveness. Imagine, countless women succumbed to Rasputin's seduction. After all, he had miraculous power. So he must be from God, they reasoned. 
They should have known better. Rasputin's contempt for the Ten Commandments betrayed his satanic sponsorship. In recent years here in North America, we've also been shocked and saddened by spiritual leaders claiming to have the power of God while indulging themselves in lawless behavior. We've seen how he, devil, the devil abuses the gift of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. He counterfeits the gift of healing. He counterfeits the gift of tongues. Does it surprise you that the devil can speak in tongues? After all, he's an angel fallen, so he can speak any language on earth or heaven. Oh, friend, please let me warn you with all my heart, beware, beware of false tongues, false miracles, false healing. At this point, of course, you may be wondering, why would Satan, who loves to hurt people, want to bring us healing? He wants to control our lives. That's why, my friend, just as he used Rasputin to deceive the people of Russia so he could plunge them into perdition, Rasputin forged his stranglehold upon the empire by winning the blessing of church leaders. Father John of Kronstadt and the saintly Bishop, Bishop Theophan, two of the most revered priests in Russia, endorsed Rasputin's ministry. They were deceived by his apparent fervent faith, able to work miracles. But as time went on, the priests had second thoughts. They heard the embarrassed confessions of women led into sin by Rasputin. The priests, being men of integrity, were horrified. Convinced at last that Rasputin's debauchery disqualified him from being a man of God, despite whatever miracles he could perform, they urged the Empress to banish the imposter. But the damage was done by the priest's previous endorsement of Rasputin. Instead of exiling his carousing holy man, Tsar Nicholas dismissed Father John. And Rasputin coarsely boasted, I've shut his trap. Listen, friend. If godly spiritual leaders can be fooled by satanic miracles, don't you think all of us ought to beware? We have the warning of God's word that the devil will perform his final deceptions through miracles. So let's watch out for kind of counterfeit agents of the Holy Spirit. Keep your eyes open and your Bible close by. Now let me say this. There is such a thing as divine healing. Praise God. I've seen many cases where the Genuine healing power of God restored sick ones from the brink of death. But I've also seen many true believers die despite their magnificent faith. And you have too, haven't you? Why does God let it happen? The fact is that there are many things we never understand in this old world. God's ways of working go beyond human comprehension. Even the Apostle Paul found himself perplexed about this matter of healing. He couldn't even get himself healed of his mysterious affliction called the thorn in the flesh. Three times he begged God for deliverance. Finally, he accepted his suffering and went on with life. Actually, this illness proved to be a blessing, keeping him humble and dependent upon God. Keep in mind that Apostle Paul's lack of healing didn't mean he lacked faith. You recall Paul even had faith to raise a man from death something faith healers today seem unable to do. Think about that for a moment. Faith healers now claim to have all the Pentecostal power of New Testament times. Yet we don't see them interrupting funerals to raise the dead to life, do we? Why not? Could it be that this matter of faith and healing isn't as cut and dried as they say it is? Well-meaning Christians insist God will definitely heal all sickness when we have faith. Now that sounds wonderful at first, but their guarantee of instant healing may not turn out to be such good news after all. It can create a tremendous load of guilt. Let me explain. If faith ought to always bring healing, then those who remain ill must not have faith. The sick are somehow not spiritual enough to be healed. Now, this type of thinking gets more serious. Listen, if the faith that saves me ought to heal me, then when I'm not healed, maybe I'm not saved. Can you see the potential for a problem here? Many dying saints cry to God to be healed, yet they remain sick. So they begin to doubt their salvation. They carry a false burden of guilt, even worse than their pain. 
Oh, thank God, salvation does not depend on whether or not we get a particular answer to prayer. Instead, being saved depends upon whether we trust Jesus, exchanging what the world offers for what he offers. It's absolutely vital to understand this matter of miraculous healing, my friend. Otherwise, we find ourselves confused by all kinds of questions. For example, sometimes I'm asked, is it lack of faith? Is it lack of faith to take medication? Well, some enthusiastic Christians imagine so. Others point out that the same God who designed our bodies has given physicians wisdom to prescribe care for it. One more point about faith and healing. God expects us to care for our bodies, which are the temples of the, of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do you think he feels when Christians ignore the warning of medical science about clogging our arteries with cholesterol and then indulging in all the greasy steaks that people might crave? And then they think they can say a magic prayer demanding instant healing from heart disease. And they call this exercising faith. Perhaps a better term for it might be presumption, prayer abuse. But now, having shared all this caution and counsel, let me say again, I believe in divine healing by faith. All I'm saying is that God expects us to cooperate with his principles of good health. And when we do, and when we become ill, true faith trusts God to heal us in his own time and way as he knows best. Sometimes he heals immediately, sometimes gradually, and sometimes he waits to heal us until the resurrection when Jesus comes. Let me ask you, does it take more faith to demand to be healed now or to commit your body to God and let him bring healing when he knows it's best? Tell me, which takes more faith, to get what I want now or let God work in his own time and way? And remember the Bible warning that the devil will work miracles in the name of Jesus? So, friend, let's reject everything that operates out of harmony with God's commandments. Only then when can we be secure from the final deceptions. I leave you with this final word of counsel from the book of Proverbs, the 16th chapter and the 25th verse. Right there on the screen, there is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Rasputin's evil ways brought about his untimely death at the age of 44. On the banks of the Neva River, he was drowned the night of December 29, 1916. Five Russian nobles, distressed about Rasputin's stranglehold on the empire, met to plot his death. They determined to poison him in the cellar of the Moika Palace, here in Leningrad. And the bait for their trap was the promise of a party with Princess Irina famous for her beauty and someone Rasputin longed to spend time with. On the night of the death, the assassins welcomed Rasputin to the palace. With the tune of Yankee Doodle Dandy playing happily upstairs, Rasputin ate several poison cakes, washing them down with poisoned wine. And although the food had enough potassium cyanide to kill an ox or two, the amazing priest didn't drop dead. He just seemed a little bit dazed. The assassins wondered what to do about their uncooperative victim. For the next two hours or so, they entertained him with music. Finally, they lost patience with their poison and shot him through the heart. A physician on the scene pronounced Rasputin dead. But then, horror of horrors, his eyes fluttered open and the hulking maniac roared to life. Furious, he lunged at his would-be killers, chasing them out into the snow-covered courtyard. There, the incredible Hulk was shot again and again. Finally, the assassins tied him up in a blue curtain and dragged him to the banks of the Neva River. A little way from here, Rasputin was thrown into the icy river where he finally drowned. Not long after Rasputin's death came the fall of the empire he led into perdition. And later, Tsar Nicholas and his family were arrested. The night of July 16, 1918, the royal household met their bloody fate. It was their reward for following the evil priest. A tragic forecast of what will happen to all who pursue spiritual deception. Now I'd like to leave you with a word of hope. 
The story itself may be sad, but it reveals by contrast the glorious heritage God offers us in Christ. Out of the ruins of the fallen Russian Empire emerged the legend of Anastasia, daughter of the Tsar. It's never been documented beyond question, but many historians are convinced that Anastasia survived the assassination of her family. On the night of death, a daring soldier rescued the beautiful young duchess, smuggling her out of the country on a farm cart to Romania. There they were married. Then followed a chain of tragic events for Anastasia. Her new husband was killed on the streets of Bucharest. The young widow escaped to Berlin to seek out her mother's relatives. She'd been there less than a week when she fell into a canal. Rescued again from death, she refused to divulge her identity for fear of sharing her family's fate. Frustrated authorities committed the homeless young wanderer to a public mental hospital. Finally, after repeated questioning, she confessed the truth. She was the Grand Duchess Anastasia, daughter of the late Tsar. Now that her royal identity was known, Anastasia began a long battle to win the rights to her family's wealth stashed in the Bank of England. Amid conflicting testimony, she never succeeded in documenting her pedigree. Anastasia finally declared in frustration, I know perfectly well who I am. I don't need to prove it to myself. How different from Anastasia's frustration is the security God offers us in Christ. Anastasia was rescued from death only to become a wandering widow. But our Lord saves us from death to the triumph of eternal life. Anastasia never managed to prove her royal identity to the satisfaction of the judge. But for us, the heavenly judge himself claims us as his royal children. We may rest secure in his acceptance. Anastasia never won access to her family's wealth, but we have continual and complete access by faith to heaven's eternal storehouse. Thank God for what he offers us in Christ. I ask you, are you a child of the king? Or are you a prodigal wandering far from your father's house? Have you yielded your life to the Lord, putting your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? I urge you to do that just now as we pray. Father in heaven, we claim by faith our eternal riches in Christ, the promise of financial sustenance as we seek first your kingdom and so much more. Forgiveness for our guilt, power over sin, healing for our bodies, whether now or on that great resurrection morning. Then at last, eternal life with you in heaven. Right now, we yield our lives to your control. Trusting in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, we pray this in his name. Amen. As we tape material for this week's telecast and experience the shocking story of Rasputin, I was impressed by the importance of knowing and doing God's will. That's why I hope you'll ask me to send you a copy of our book, Comrades in Christ. More than just a travelogue in print, its pages bring us vital truth from God's word for our time. Just Write or call, and our staff will send you a personal copy of Comrades in Christ. Free of charge, of course, just as soon as we hear from you. Now here then is the information you need. As a convenience, you may request the free gift offer by calling our toll-free number, 1-800-253-3000. Call right now, that's 1-800-253-3000. Remember, the offer is sent by mail, free and postpaid. You may have to dial the number more than once, but please keep trying. The operator needs only your name, address, and phone number, and the name of the offer you want. Call toll-free now, 1-800-253-3000. Lines are open now. That's 1-800-253-3000. If you prefer, you may request the offer by writing to George Vandeman, Thousand Oaks, California, 91360. Thank you for your letters and prayer requests. 
Pastor Bud Otis is south of Moscow at the New Adventist Seminary. He represents the church's Office of Soviet Affairs. Let's get acquainted. God's people circle the earth. Today we meet a Seventh-day Adventist Christian who cares about people. Let's get acquainted. Pastor Otis, tell us briefly about the history of the seminary here at Sayoski. Seminary was given to the church on January 27, 1987. We started construction on February 4 of 1987. Uh, we started our first class in the fall of 1988, and we dedicated the building in December of 1988. And we currently have 50 seminary students and 45 agriculture students. What are the plans for the seminary and the church here in the Zioski Tula region? Right now we have under construction a dormitory for 180 uh, students and it will also house the cafeteria which is currently an administration building and we need to move it out of that into the dormitory. We also have a uh, library that's under construction. Uh, we need to have a um, 10,000 volume library as soon as possible and so we have that under construction and we have a uh, store that we're building here to serve the community where we can sell the produce from the farm and products from our publishing house. So the city of Zaoxki and the Tula region is desperate for this uh, store to open. They're very excited and anxious about it. I think it'll be a tremendous opportunity for us to display our literature as well as our produce from the farm. But now the time has come all too quickly to say goodbye, everyone. But remember, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God.